the next talk by Alex Lubotsky. Uh, thank, thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here again. And I have to say that I'm very excited and nervous about this talk. Not because of you guys, even though it's a very respectable audience, but because it's the first time in my, my life that I'm giving a talk with a PowerPoint. So I hope, <laughs> for, for me, this is an eye. <laughs> For me, it's a very high-level uh, technology, so I hope it will work uh, fine. Um, I was asked to, to give kind of a survey talk about uh, randomness in group theory, the way it is used, and uh, what is used for, and what you can do. Preparing my, and, and I, I kind of, uh, uh, I, I did some work in that area, but preparing this talk, I realized that uh, there is much more than uh, I knew about, and uh, definitely much more than can be covered, so I, I kind of added a subtitle uh, from the finite to the infinite. I'll try to, to talk about uh, works which are related to finite groups and but toward infinite group, and sometimes that you have some kind of interplay uh, between, between the two. Uh, so let's, let's see. As uh, in many, many cases when, when uh, probability uh, is used within mathematics, uh, one can trace uh, the beginning to Erdos, and indeed uh, Erdos and Turan published seven papers with the same title on, on uh, some, pro well, there was some problems of statistical group theory one, some problems of statistical group theory two, etc. until seven between between the years uh, 65 to 72. Um, and uh, well, there is temptation to, to say that this is kind of the birth of the subject of a probabilistic group theory, statistical group theory. Uh, here is a typical result uh, from uh, this paper, like that uh, uh, it's mainly about the permutation group and the typical result is the following, a random permutation a random permutation in the symmetric group uh, on n uh, letters has approximately log n cycles and its order is n to the one half plus little o of one log n. So this is this, is this type of, uh, 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 these type of results uh, were proved in this, in this paper. But if one wants to be honest, in a way, these papers are not really about group theory. They are really combinatorics, because we know what is a permutation, and there is very little group theoretical content in these papers. It's, it's more kind of combinatorial probabilistic, though, as I will point out very soon, some of these results are very important, or were used later on in group theoretical consideration, and as we will be able to see in a few minutes, um, if, if one wants to claim uh, for a more ancient history, we can go to a netto conjecture. Well, as, as in many cases, it was called netto conjecture only, only after it was proved. Uh, 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 but anyway, already in 1882, netto wrote in, in, uh, in, uh, in a paper that, uh, well, that you kind of expect that if you pick up that he wrote something like that. Almost any pair of elements of, of the symmetric group will generate either the alternating group or the symmetric group. Of course, you cannot say that they will generate the symmetric group. The alternating group is of index two, so with probability one quarter, both of them will be inside the alternating group. Um, but the expectation is that they will generate a, a either the alternating group or the symmetric group. And this conjecture uh, was indeed proved in 1969 by John Dixon, who right away made the conjecture that, well, if this was a success, and uh, by that time, the classification of finite simple group was not yet over, but people were talking about that, and they knew that the alternating groups is just the first family of many finite simple groups, so he expected that uh, for that uh, uh, for all finite simple groups, if you pick up random two elements, they will generate the group. When we say that, what we mean by that? We mean 
that when the order of the group is going to infinity, the probability that two elements of the group will generate it is approaching, uh, approaching one. And indeed, and indeed this conjecture was proved. Uh, but before that, let me say, uh, um, uh, meanwhile, the classification of finite simple group was, was, uh, was finished. And without uh, just uh, uh, stating the full theorem, uh, will take us a, a, a semester course to give you the list of all of them and to explain what they are. But basically, the finite simple groups are the alternating groups, the groups of Lie type. And the group of Lie types are groups which are analog of the algebraic groups uh, of the semi-simple or simple Lie groups in over finite fields, something like SLN FQ, N by N matrices of determinant one over the finite field of order Q, or symplectic group, unitary group, orthogonal groups, etc. But there are also some kind of a, a less known groups. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I'm not talking to expert. Uh, but just that you know there are something G2, E6, X7, etc. And there are infinitely many families. There are Suzuki groups, Ri groups, uh, uh, etc., etc. And, uh, but, uh, and finitely many what is called sporadic groups which are not in the list, uh, which are not really uh, falling into the scheme. A conjecture like that, the sporadic group are irrelevant because for finitely many cases are not important, even though the sporadic group are very interesting, they are completely irrelevant for this. Uh, and the conjecture was proved, uh, so in 1990, uh, Bill Cantor and I managed to work it out for all the classical groups and uh, which contains uh, the, the, the split group and the, the untwisted group, but we had some uh, troubles with some of the ex exceptional groups, and this was worked out by Liebeck and Shalev uh, five years later. Uh, let me explain something here, which I think it's, it's I want to, to put it into, uh, into a context. The proof of Dixon was, uh, was elementary. Let me kind of try to, to say a few words about, about the proof. Dixon, uh, uh, prove the following. He, he, he said, well, if we pick up two random elements in the symmetric group, he proved first that they generate, that with high probability, they generate a primitive subgroup of permutation. I even don't want to define what is primitive. Everyone understands what is a transitive group. The group generated by them acts transitively on, on the set one up to n. Primitive is a somewhat stronger uh, property than transitivity. And then he used classical results actually from the 19th century. Um, uh, there have been an, a, an ongoing interest in the theory of permutation groups. Uh, uh, what are the primitive subgroups of the symmetric groups? And actually, in some sense, there are not that many. Or, or well, there are various criterions which ensure uh, that if a subgroup of Sn is primitive, then it, it is, and it satisfies uh, uh, another condition, then it must be the full SN or the full alternating group. And he used one of these criterions using some of the Erdos-Turan type results. The criterion was that if, the, if uh, the, a primitive group contains a cycle of, a prime, uh, or of prime length, then it must be the full symmetric or group or the full alternating group. And then he showed, using kind of this uh, Turan, uh, erdos turan machinery, that uh, uh, random two are primitive and the group contains a cycle, and then he deduced that it's, uh, it, uh, this is everything. So this was kind of elementary proof. All the other proofs for the other finite simple groups really requires the classification of finite simple group. But I want to stress, it's not only need the classification because I'm saying that the theorem is correct for all finite simple groups. Even if you just want to prove it for the family, I guess that most of you would be happy with the case of SLNP. If you want to prove it for SLNP, you need the classification of all finite simple groups. And let me explain why, what comes into the game. Of course, I will not give you uh, the, the full proof, but basically all these, all these, these, uh, these two, two, two papers, as well as 
And a later paper by Babai, Babai actually reproved Dixon results, giving a, a, a much better estimate on the rate of convergence to one, uh, because you can ask, you can start to ask some, uh, some more uh, quantitative questions. And basically, uh, um, since 1990, all the methods used the, the following technique, and, and here is the basic observation that uh, started all this game. Let's see. Let's define PK of G, the probability that K tuple of elements in G to the K, K tuple of elements, generate G. I pick up, so we are really interested in two, but later on we might be interested in more than two, so let's define it for, uh, for all K. What's the probability that two elements generate, the, uh, generate uh, K elements generate the group? Well, uh, there is one equation which is trivial, so I didn't write it down. This is equal to one minus the probability that they don't generate the group, right? <laughs> okay. But here is something which is trivial, but, but very important. <laughs> Not generating the group. What's the probability? If you don't generate the group, you are inside a proper subgroup. If you are in a proper subgroup, you are inside a, pro a, a proper maximal subgroup. Okay? So now, this is a crucial observation because it really now means that if you add the one line that I didn't write down, then you get that the probability the K element generate the group is greater or equal 1 minus. And now I have... Uh, uh, now, let's see, I, I'm, I'm taking a sum over all maximal subgroups of G, and I take what's the probability for a given maximal subgroup of G that I'm inside, that all, the, you see, that all the K elements, in order not to generate the group, all of them should be inside, inside M. So this is M to the K divided by G to the K, and this is equal 1 minus sigma over all maximal subgroup of G, of G to the K, uh, G, uh, the, the index, this is the notation for the index of M in G, right, uh, uh, to the minus K, right, this is everything. Okay, so if you have the feeling that uh, we have some kind of a zeta function here, then you are not that wrong, and you can write, it's a kind of a zeta function which for some, for various, I, I'm not going to elaborate about this aspect, but you can think of it as, you can define it now for every a, a, a number s, you can define for a given group g, zeta g of s, sum over all the maximal subgroup of g, uh, g over m, uh, the index of m in g to the minus s, and really the theorem up there, the Dixon conjecture, well, really what, what uh, uh, Bill Cantor and I and what Liebeck Shavelev and, and what Baba proved, we proved that in all these cases, P2 of G, uh, sorry, the inequality says that P2 of G is 1 minus the, zeta, the, the value of the zeta function at 2. And what we really proved that, 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 uh, G, uh, that zeta G of 2 goes to 0 when the order of the group uh, uh, going to infinity. Okay, so this is just a formal, I think, uh, completely trivial. But now you really have to evaluate this. And, and then the proof is based on the fundamental group of Ashbacher. Ashbacher basically classified all the Mac, well, so uh, 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 let's say his work is sort of more uh, complete for the classical groups, and therefore it was so somewhat easier to do it for the classical group. Then you needed some uh, more uh, stories. Okay, I, I don't go. To, I, I'm not going to go to the technical details. But basically, Ashbacher uh, gave a kind of a list of what are the maximal subgroups of of a, a finite simple group. For example, for SLNP. Now his list. As uh, it's, it's all theorems in the class in, in, on the theory of finite simple group are usually very long. Uh, this one is not as long as the classification theorem itself, but even if you, if you want to get the list of the maximal subgroup of SLNP, uh, then there are nine possibilities. <laughs> eight of them, if you are semi-expert, you can guess. Eight of them are really coming 
From well, you know, you can take a subly group, you take the symplectic group inside the SLN, if n is even, then blah, 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 it will be. But you can kind of, you can kind of uh, understand what they are. But the, always the problem, uh, the most of the work is on the ninth case. The ninth case is a finite simple group which is maximal in another finite simple group. For example, you all know an example of this. This is A5, which sits in SL2P. There are, for infinitely many primes, P, A5, right, this is, even the, the analyst here knows about that, because this group... No, 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 but unfortunately, we cannot really do the, the, use the work of Nori for that. I mean, that's, I mean, in a way, you know, a, a, a Weisfeller who proved the same results as Nori uh, uh, really used the classification and used some of the, uh, the work of Ashbacher. It kind of goes the other way around. Uh, at least as of now, I don't, I, I'm not saying that it will be completely impossible and maybe, actually, maybe it's time to try to do the, the to use the work of Larsen and Pink, maybe to, to prove something. But the difficulty is really about this ninth case. This caused most of the troubles for, for, for such a proof. I mean, modulo the list of Ashbacher. But what I want to, uh, to explain, that's kind of important that to me to, to, to pass the message that even if you want to prove such a result, at least with the current knowledge, for, for a specific family of finite simple group that you know very well, like SLNP, you need the classification to prove these results about, about the probability. Anyway, this is the story, and this was done. Now, at this... What, sorry? Yeah, if, if, well, if, if you can show that, this, the, that the, the ninth one does not appear, yeah. if you want to show that there exists a family of finite simple group for which Dixon conjecture is true for them, then maybe you can do. But uh, uh, just to make it, to, to relate it to some of the other talks, in some sense, all these results is the first step in what we heard before, because this is like saying that the Cayley graph is connected, right? Nowadays, we want that the Cayley graph are even expanders with respect to random uh, generators. On the other hand, here, we don't bound the rank. Okay, this is kind of result, which is true for all finite simple groups, not of bounded rank. Yeah. Yes. The main term comes from the OZ crew boots, but it's sort of difficult to control what eventually is not so important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, this, this uh, uh, actually, this work started a big industry of results, and, and like people are interested uh, nowadays, and there are some applications to study this zeta function for S. You see, this has a meaning even if it's not in integers. Like you want to prove that zeta of s of s is going to zero when g is going to infinity, maybe for s, which is equal to uh, one plus epsilon or whatever, or maybe even less than one. I mean, it's, it, you can ask and sometimes this come up. Let me just throw a few of the applications just to give you a feeling. There is a, there is a lot of literature. Uh, here I'm a, I'm a bit, I'm a kind of a nervous to talk about it because Bob Guralnik is, is here and is one of the big ex experts, so I'm afraid that, that I, I will say something which is not completely correct, but I hope I will stick with some of the things I still know. Uh, so, like, an, an old, uh, here is an old conjecture of Magnus, which was not solved by that, but uh, some are using these methods uh, completely revolutionized the, the, the attitude to, toward this problem. Magnus conjectured uh, long ago that the free group is residually any infinite family of non-abelian finite simple groups. What, what does it say in, in simple words though? It really says that I'll give you any family, and he conjectured it much before the classification was, uh, co was uh, completed. Uh, he said, I'll give you, you basically want to say that it's impossible that all finite simple groups will satisfy the same law, the same word, and even not satisfying by, if you, if you uh, pick up generators, or let's say it in a, in a positive way. You want to say, I'll, gi I'll give you any, a, 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 
any inf- uh, give me any infinite family of finite simple groups, give me a word in the free group, a non-trivial, I can find an epimorphism from the free group onto one of these groups such that the, the image of that element is non-trivial. So actually, there have been a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of partial results on this conjecture. Somehow, group theorists uh, loved it for many years. Eventually, uh, Weigel, uh, Weigel uh, uh, solved it completely in 1999 uh, in three papers, which applies uh, quite uh, sophisticated machinery studying that. But few years after that, kind of following this, uh, this type of uh, thinking, uh, Dixon, Pibers, uh, uh, Sheresh, and Shaleb came with a beautiful, uh, 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 r- relatively short paper proving the conjecture in full by probabilistic method. Because basically what they prove, they prove that uh, uh, um, if you, you fix a word W in the free group, and then ask, then ask yourself, what's the probability for two elements in the group G to satisfy two conditions? One, that they generate the group, and this we already know that the probability is one. And the second condition is that, that if you put X and Y in the word W, you don't get one. And of course, you feel like it must be that these are two completely independent problems. Of course, you have to prove it. I mean, it's an untrivial, but still, you prove there are so many, we generate the group, and so many, uh, such a W, X, Y is not one, then you can find X and Y, which, are, which satisfy both. And in fact, as you can imagine, the proof gives much better results. You can find uh, many such pairs, etc. So they gave kind of a uniform, approach to the, to the, uh, to the, to this, uh, to this Magnus problem. And, uh, well, here is another something more complicated, but of the same style. Um, one, uh, uh, as I said, there is, a, there is nowadays a really industry of, uh, of uh, results, which of the following form. You pick up two elements of a finite simple group, but put some condition on them. For example, Pick an element of order two, a random element of order two, and uh, we know that every finite simple group, when I say now finite simple group, I mean non abelian finite simple group, the billion are not there. Uh, uh, we know by Faith Thompson theorem that every finite simple group uh, is of uh, even order, which means there are elements of order two. Well, not all finite simple groups are divisible by three. Uh, Glaberman classified them, but all of them except for the Suzuki groups. Are, uh, contains element of order three, and then you say, well, pick up an element of order two, random element of order two, and random element of order three, and the result is almost similar. I mean, I, I put it to show you that sometimes there are surprises. The result that for almost all groups, indeed, a random element of order two and the random element of order three generate G with probability one, but if you take the symplectic group of dimension four, the probability is only half. So you see, you have to be a bit careful here and not jump to guess that everything works. You know, sometimes the questions can be delicate. But still, this is kind of, uh, of uh, rich enough, even the half. And this work led to a solution, another kind of a long-standing problem that uh, group theorists for various reasons were interested. What are the finite simple quotients of the modular group? As you know, the modular group is a free product of a, cy- uh, of a cyclic group of order two and a cyclic group of order three. So finite simple quotient of uh, that, it's really a problem not on the modular group. It's really a problem about the finite simple groups. Which type of, of, uh, of finite simple groups are generated by uh, elements of order two and three? And basically you get that essentially all of them except of the Suzuki group and um, um, Anyway, uh, this was uh, this kind of, and, and uh, somehow um, uh, 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 this was. Uh, uh, this is an asymptotic result, right? So you have to be a bit careful about the small groups. But the problem was completely solved by Lubeck and Male, 
who showed, uh, who gave exactly what are the simple groups which are quotients. And now there are many more probabilistic results in this, for example, a very a lovely result is sometimes called one and a half, like this is two random two generators, sometimes you talk about one and a half random generators, namely you, you, you fix one element and you ask, now I take the, the, the second one at random, whether they do generate. Uh, you, you, you want to take sometimes two conjugate elements and, and you want to ask. And some of these have various application uh, and, and various direction. Here is something which is sort of, a, a, again, um, a, a, I, I, well, I have to admit that in my taste, some of the solutions to this problem is much more interesting than the problems. But anyway, uh, some of these problems were going back to the, to the first half of the, of the, of the 20th century. Um, uh, people were interested, what, are, what finite simple groups are quotients of the triangle 237 group? Uh, there was a special interest in that. Uh, we know this uh, uh, Urwitz theorem that the isometric group of a Riemann surface of genus G is of order at most 84 uh, G minus one, and, and uh, somehow it's known that there are infinitely many genuses for which this upper bound is, is, is a tend, and there are infinitely many which is not a tend, and you can do better, and the question is when it can be a tend, what kind of groups can appear, and what kind of finite simple group uh, uh, can appear. And, and now, if you ask this question from the point of view of the finite simple group, then, to be a quotient of this 237 group is the following question. When I, can I find two elements in the, free, in the simple group, one of order two, one of order three, which generate the group? Well, up to this point, of, yes, I can, this was the previous theorem, but I want that the product of them is of order seven. Ah, that's more complicated. And in fact, here the solution is not, uh, this is still not, uh, this is not, this is still uh, open, but there are many results like uh, about, uh, there is a Higman conjecture, which, which uh, uh, of the alternative group is a quotient of triangle group, of Fuchsian groups. There are many, many, uh, many, many results in this direction, and the probabilistic method is, uh, is kind of, uh, 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 is very, very efficient for this type of question. Um, let me just uh, uh, to try to impress you, but in a second I will tell you the secret. It should not be too impressed. But let me show you kind of a solution to an, uh, to an uh, algebraic geometric problem coming from this. Uh, there is something uh, called a, a Buville surface. This is a rigid complex surface, which is uh, obtained, um, as it's written here, as a, a, a product of two non-singular projective uh, uh, curves, higher genus curve. And you have an action of G on that product, uh, which is free, and a free action, and somehow there is an interest in this type of rigid, the complex surfaces. Uh, they, as you can, uh, uh, well, kind of an example of them was uh, studied by Uville, and then Catanese uh, sort of generalized this notion and named it a, a Buville surface. And he, and, there, and he asked what kind of, surfaces like that you can get, or which kind of groups, finite simple group, give rise to such, give rise to such surfaces. And um, uh, in a paper of, of a Bauer, uh, Ingrid Bauer, Catanese, and Fritz Grunewald, they conjecture that all non-abelian finite simple group, except of the alternating group of five letters, give rise to this. So you see, there is an exception sometime, and the, which you kind of show that this group cannot, but somehow they thought that the obstruction will be, will be uh, uh, kind of eliminated if, if the group is large enough, either by size, uh, by rank, or by the field. Uh, well, uh, recently, uh, uh, Shelley Gerion, um, 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 uh, Mike Larson, and I managed to prove almost the theorem. We proved that for almost all finite simple groups, uh, you have it, but we cannot really, uh, uh, we, we, we are not sure about the small groups, and uh, in, in, in principle, our proof is effective. You, we, we can say when it starts to be, but it's, it starts to be true very, very far. So there is still work to do if you really want to, to prove it. Anyway, to be honest, 
Oh, you prove it now all, except of A5, I guess. Okay, so you see, I had a reason to be worried about Bob Goranlik being in the audience. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, um, well, the truth is that there is no, the, 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 this theorem is about uh, 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 what kind of, uh, uh, given a group, you want it to be a quotient of triangle groups in, in, in different ways, so you can apply some of the methods I described above to prove something like that. Okay. Um, another, uh, uh, let me just mention in brief, because this was a solution just recently of, a, of, a, of a almost 60 years old conjecture. Um, and this, I, I may come back. This conjecture looks like an unimportant one. In some sense, it's, you know, some of these conjectures are not so important for themselves. It's kind of, uh, is a, it's a way for us to see if we are really making progress in our understanding. Can we prove uh, results like that, which is so simple to state? The whole conjecture is that uh, if G is a non-abelian finite simple group, then every element of G is a commutator. You know, that just simply that there exist X and Y such that G is a commutator of X and Y. I mean, and and uh, this was known for many, many groups by many, many work and then and then, and it was completed uh, uh, last year by Liebeck, O'Brien, Shalev, and Tip, uh, and type using a computer. And, uh, and, uh, and it's kind of amazing it was using, now you might think that, okay, they prove it by theoretical for large groups, and okay, there have been some cases to check in computer. No, that's not, the, this was not the case. They used the computer to prove the first case of induction process. So it's not like if the computer failed, it's not like that it fails only for finitely many groups. If the computer failed, then the whole proof fails or for this. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, now philosophical problem, uh, if we accept it as a proof or not. At least, I guess, nobody would try to look for a counterexample now. <laughs> anyway, and again, there is, a, there is a, 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 a kind of this type of probabilistic are, are, uh, are used it, but uh, let me, let me uh, time is running, so let me, let me go ahead. Uh, here I just want to tell you uh, uh, even more vaguely, I decided not at all to talk about that, even though some of you may be interested in this more than in the other thing I have to say, but I had the feeling that I want to take, the, as you are a captive audience, I have to tell you, I want to tell you about randomness in group theory, not of the kind of thing you, you hear about in the, in the computer science conferences anyway. And this is, a, a, but still I must mention at least that all this uh, computational group theory really gave new life to this statistical group theory. In computational group theory, Nowadays, especially when we want to, when we do uh, uh, algorithms which require uh, random uh, elements of the group, then it's give kind of a new life to all these type of, uh, of questions, new problem. Um, for example, random algorithms very often need pseudo-random elements of the group G, and there are various algorithms to generate pseudo-random elements, uh, uh, well, you can generate them either by, by going along a random walk on the group and on the Cayley graph, and a lot of study, of course, is in this direction. A famous algorithm which does something different than just going on a random group on the Cayley graph is, is what's called the product replacement algorithm, uh, which I think was mentioned maybe in one of the talks here. Uh, I want to say, that this type of problems gave, uh, raised back the type of questions studied by Erdos and Turan. Erdos and Turan, as I said, they, they study what's the typical behavior of a, per, of, a, of a permutation, number of cycles, etc., etc. Now you can study these type of problems for groups of Lie type. I'll give you a random matrix in the symplectic group or in SLN, and you can ask various type of questions about what's the multiplicity of its eigenvalues, how the, what's the distribution of the multiplicities of the eigenvalues of such, of such a matrix, and suddenly this type of, um, this type of problems 
um, uh, are getting kind of new interest and there are uh, a, a good number of people in the last decade or so which are working in this type of, on this type of problem. Uh, but I decided uh, not to talk about that. Instead, I'll take you to something which is a little bit, uh, at least on the face of it, a little bit more uh, uh, peculiar. I have to admit that I have some uh, uh, kind of a special uh, uh, love for this type of groups. But I was also want to show you that the study of profinite groups is relevant to the, even to the computer science community in some sense, because um, I'll define in a minute what is a profinite group, but a prof, profinite group are kind of inverse limit of finite group. Every result on a profinite group, on a one profinite group, is really an asymptotic result on infinitely many finite groups. And sometimes it's kind of more convenient. Uh, um, it's give you, uh, a, a, first of all, a language, but secondly, also sometimes technique to work in, in this context. So let me give a little propaganda to this, uh, to these groups, this uh, profinite, uh, to this uh, story of uh, uh, of profinite groups. So what is what is a profinite group? Profinite group is a topological group. So which means it's a group, which also has a topology on it, which is supposed to be compact, Hausdorff, basically Hausdorff really means that every point is closed in the topology, so that's what you imagine anyway, and totally disconnected, namely every uh, connected su subset contains only a single point, namely if you have more than one point, you can separate them. But the real importance for us is that, that a profinite group, or the definition is completely equivalent to being an inverse limit of a, of a, of a finite group. So you, it's, it's, a, it's an inverse limit of a, of a finite group. For example, the periodic integers is such, it's such a group. Now, being a compact group, you can, uh, being a compact group, it has a R measure, and we can normalize the R measure to have measure one, and now we can ask probability questions about profinite group. What the probability that elements generate the group? Now, generate the group means generate a dense subgroup. If I take two elements, uh, every profinite group which is not finite is uncountable, so I cannot generate it algebraically. I, uh, by two elements, I can generate it topologically. And we can ask various questions, but let me first give you a few examples of such group. First of all, a, a kind of a generic way, not generic, but a way to construct such examples is the following. Let's start with gamma to be a finitely generated discrete group, and we'll take G to be the profinite completion of gamma. What does it mean? Well, we can define it in an abstract way or in a concrete way. The abstract way will be put a topology on the group gamma, in order to put a topology on a group, you have to declare what are the neighborhoods of every point. It's enough, if it's a group, it's enough to define the neighborhoods of the identity because they can move them now to any other point. And you declare all the finite index subgroups to be the neighborhoods of the identity. Uh, and then you complete the group in a process, there is a kind of an abstract process to complete a, a, a space which is not complete, like you have Cauchy sequences. This is kind of abstract method, it's something important, but you can also construct it uh, in, a, in a kind of a direct way as the inverse limit of gamma mod n, where now n runs over all the normal subgroups of gamma of finite index. So you look at all the finite quotients of n, and you take the inverse limit of them. And this is the profinite completion. For example, if you take Z, the integers, so the infinite cyclic group, the finite quotient are Z mod NZ, and you take the inverse limit of them, you get what we call Zart. This Zart, by the way, here is, if, if you have if you've never seen it, take this as a little exercise. This is equal of, of the ZP, ZP is the periodic integers, product over all primes. And this equation is called the Chinese reminder theorem. It's completely equivalent to the Chinese reminder theorem. If I would have time, I will show you how to, how to express, this is, even for the expert, this is a good, a good challenge, how to express Dirichlet 
theorem on, on primes on arithmetic progressions in the profinite language. There is an equivalent form there. This is for those who know the material and on board can think about this exercise. Okay, so this is Z hat. Z, Z is the free group on one generators. I can also take FD to be the free group on D generators and take its pro-finite completion. Well, its pro-finite completion is the free object on D generators in the category of pro-finite groups. I mean, these are all, I mean, if you see it for the first time in your life, I'm, I, I know it's not so easy to digest, but it's all uh, uh, kind of very, very, very simple, abstract thing. But now let me be a little bit more technical, but still I try to convince you that there is some interest in these type of questions. Um, let's look, let's define SD to be, uh, we, we take a group G, now pro-finite group, say. Uh, finite group is also pro-finite, so we can say. But I'm taking, uh, but this is interesting for, for a, 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 a infinite pro-finite group. I take D tuples of element, oi, I'm sorry. N is equal D, or D is equal N here, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm taking a D elements, and I look at the group. This is my notation for the group generated by them, uh, this type of brackets. And, and then I take the closure. We are working in the topological category. And, and I ask, uh, this is the set uh, of all, uh, the set of, uh, of all the tuples that generate a finite index subgroup. Now we can look at a, at, at, a, at a larger set that now I take all the D tuples such that the normal closure of them is a finite index. So I, I'm not just, so if I do like, you know, these double brackets, this means the normal closure. I take the minimal normal subgroup containing these element, and I take the closure of it, and I ask, what's the probability that this is a finite index? And then there is a lovely result, a very, a very easy one, actually, but really a lovely result of, of Yard, and in some sense, this a little lovely result started the industry of probability on, uh, on pro-finite group. Well, uh, Yarden studied this mainly for Galvo group. There are a lot of interest in this, in uh, studying um, uh, this type of probability questions about various automorphism groups, for example, for the absolute uh, Galva group of the, of the rationals, but I, I won't go to that. Uh, but he proved if you take this little group, Z hat, and you, and you ask yourself, well, what's the probability that an element of that group will generate a finite index subgroup? Then the probability is zero, he, he proved. On the other hand, if you ask what the probability that two or more elements will, will generate a finite index subgroup, then it's one. And the proof is basically one line, or, or few lines if you have to elaborate. It's, it's kind, of a, 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 a kind of a beautiful use of the borel cantelli lemma. Uh, and of course, the difference between d equal one and d equal, greater equal two is the question whether this sequence converges or diverges. So that's a nice little exercise to prove. Uh, but let me, let me mention another result which need more efforts. In fact, it needs the classification of finite simple groups, believe it or not. And I will, uh, I, and I, I'm going to, to, to talk about it immediately again, so please pay attention to one part of it. Uh, it says that if you take the free profinite group so this was the free profinite group on one generator. If you take the free profinite group on two or more generators, so F1 is Z hat, I don't know what happened there. Then, well, if you, for every D, if you ask what's the probability that D element will generate a finite index subgroup, then it's always zero here. Now, if you ask what's the probability that the normal closure will be a finite index. Well, if D is less or equal N, the probability is zero, but now pay attention to this, to this last line. If you take more relations than generators, then, you, then the game is, is kind of, usually in this game you get either zero, one game. Here is kind of, is a special kind of result in the sense that uh, remember this, that if we take 
a D, a free group on n generators, and we take d relations, and d is bigger than n, with a positive probability is bigger than zero, but smaller than one, that the normal closure is a finite index. And this needs a classification, but actually, I brought these results not because it's in the classification. You know, in this business, many things in the classification. Uh, ah, okay. I'll, 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 uh, please remember this last result. I will say a little bit here in order to convince you, to show you why this type of results are relevant for people who are interested in finite structures. But, yeah, you wanted to ask something. Do you mind spending again with the hat? Is? The hat? Yeah. The hat is the pro-finite completion uh, Z hat is the pro-finite completion of Z. You take the inverse limit of Z mod N Z over all N. It's equal to the direct product over all primes P, so all primes P of the periodic integers. Okay. Uh, let me say this kind of quickly, but I, I really wanted to, to show you that somehow some results on this profinite can give you something that are interesting even for computational uh, questions, even though it looks very abstract. Uh, Avino Aman in 96 really started a, a various work on, on an interesting notion. He said, yeah, we all know to define what is a finitely generated group. We can also define what is a finitely generated profinite group, it means that there are finitely many elements which generate a dense sample. He said, let's see what, he defines the notion of positively finitely generated. What does it mean? Not only that it's generated by a finitely many element, but for some number d, it is generated with positive, with positive probability by finitely many elements, like random element, we generate it with a positive probability. So if you look back, you see, for example, that the free profinite group are not, are not uh, positively finitely generated. You see this result, uh, they are not. Uh, but he showed that the, there is something called the free pro-solvable groups are positively finitely generated. If you know what is it, fine. If you don't know, also fine. A, and a beautiful uh, uh, results of, uh, of Mann and Shalev, they show that the, that the pro-finite group is positive finitely generated if and only if G is polynomial maximal subgroup growth. Somehow you feel we are back to this counting maximal subgroup. You count how many maximal subgroups you have of a given index, of index n, and, and this grows polynomially if and only if the group is, is, is positively finitely generated. Now this, I guess, looks to all of you as a very abstract, as, as a very abstract result about some kind of groups, which I guess you never cared about. But um, let me just show you and, and take my word that uh, uh, here is a theorem I proved which was a, it's even a stronger than a conjecture of Puck, which came from computational group theory. And the proof of this theorem is really translating that proof to the finite language. Okay, it's just, I, what I really have to know is to know these two subjects, not to do any original work here. Uh, basically, let is what, it was, what, what we prove it. Let G be a finite group generated by D elements, then, I, 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 then I, I, I think I, it's not, I don't need to convince you that it's kind of a very natural problem in, uh, on finite groups. If I have a finite group and I start to pick up, not necessarily simple, I start to pick up elements from the group and I ask how much time it will take me till I, what's the expected time that it will take me till I will get a set of generators. So here is a, a, a fairly strong uh, uh, inequality which is essentially optimal. If G is gen finite group generated by D elements, then the expected number of random generators for G is at most E. E is the, the E, the number E, times D of G. D of G is the, is the number of generators of G plus 2E log log G plus 11. And basically, this type of theorem is really a translation. In some sense, it's a translation of, of, of this theorem 
to the, to the well, it's, it's, it's need a little work, but, uh, but it's, it's a very short paper model of this paper. Uh, uh, it's a translation, and that's what I, I wanted to say before, that in many cases, a result on a pro-finite group is really a kind of an asymptotic result on, fam on, on, fi on families of finite, of finite groups. What? Yeah, you need this log log. It's, it's, yeah, I think, I think, I don't think we can, uh, uh, well, I think, you think it will be constant time, the number of generators. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think you can get it by constant time. Uh, DG. We, uh, I mean, if uh, I, I mean, if if you can improve this or not, I'm not sure. Well, the the conjecture of Park, by the way, was d times log log g, and this is d plus. So I was very happy at that time. Now I don't remember if I checked now if this is uh, better or not. But uh, uh, well, this is uh, eight years ago, and, and well, it published eight years ago, so you can imagine that. I don't remember, but I'll. I'll go back and I'll check it. Can you repeat what expected number? Like, what's, how, how much time it will take you on the average? You, yeah, you pick random element and you stop when you get a set of generators. So, and you can imagine that for, rand, for kind of random algorithms, this is a kind of a very natural problem. But let me, uh, uh, let me jump to finitely generate discrete group, but I, but I will come to the pro-finite as I promise you because I want, there is something which is an open problem that I want to stress here and to kind of suggest a way to look at it, which unfortunately I cannot really. Now this is a big subject uh, about finitely generated groups, random finitely generated groups. I'm not going to touch, oh, oh my God, I have to start to rush, okay. Uh, so, so this is like random groups a la Gromov, you know, Gromov started this, this type of idea. Let me just, just say briefly what, what, is, what is the subject about. Um, so you take a free group, FD, on D generators, a free group on D generators, on, uh, on the generators X1 up to XD. You look at the ball of radius N in the Cayley graph. Um, with respect to these generators, and then you choose randomly L elements, R1 up to R, uh, uh, RL in the ball, and you look at the quotient group, the free group, divided by the normal closure of R1 up to RL. And you consider this as the kind of a random group, and you ask what's are typical properties of this gamma when L is going to infinity. So first of all, people usually say that this is the random finitely generated groups. This is completely wrong because it's not typical. It's fine. All of these groups are finitely presented. And the typical finitely generated group is not finitely presented because there are only countably many finitely presented groups and there are uncountably finitely generated. So this is something that we can uh, still forgive them. But there is something that I think is less forgivable that people kind of assume, uh, uh, kind of ignore the issue of repetition. You see, this gives you the same group many times and in a way which is completely unbalanced somehow. So it's not, it's, you, you see, the, the whole problem in all these randomness issues, if you do randomness on a countable set, it's very rarely that you have a really natural measure that everyone agree. There is actually a beautiful, on the web I saw a beautiful uh, 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 paper by Barry Mazur, uh, I think it was kind of a lecture he gave in the Acolis conference, that he saw in number theory these peculiar properties. It depends how you look at randomness, and then you can definitely get different results. We know we can cheat about probability, especially along uh, uh, with countable set. Anyway, there are various models here. You can, uh, usually you, you work with these fixed, and L is also fixed. This is one model, and you let N going to infinity. There is a very popular model that you take D be fixed, uh, you, you pick delta between zero to one, and then you take L to be huge number. You take some fractional of the, of the of, uh, you take the, the order of the ball to some delta, like you take square root of the number of elements. 
And, and that's a very popular module, and uh, there are many, many works by this. A wonderful uh, uh, survey of essentially all what is done up to 2005 is this, uh, it's almost a book, it's like 100 page, pages uh, uh, booklet by Olivier, which give many results here. Uh, it is kind of a typical results, if you know what's, what I'm talking about, fine. If you don't know, just uh, get the impression. If delta is less than half, then a random group will be hyperbolic, uh, which is something which is, say, close to be free. On the other hand, if it's more than half, it collapses, and it will be a trivial group. And if it's a, a more than one quarter, one third, then it has cash down property T. If you combine one and three, you are getting something which is really not a quite surprising result. The fact that there are groups which are at the same time hyperbolic and as cash down property T. I'm not claiming that it was not known before. It was not known before. It, it, was, no, it was known before, uh, even explicit example, lattices in the, in the group SPN1. But I have to say, uh, somehow I still, I still don't believe they exist, even though there are two proofs. Because some hyperbolicity is something which is very close to being free very far, on, on, and property T is something with a lot of uh, rigidity in some sense. And it's, uh, it's a kind of surprising that there are groups with that as well. Anyway, it, 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 it shows you the potential of this, of this method. Uh, I want to put two warnings and I, and, and, uh, uh, here. First of all, uh, the, the model is important. You know, there is a feeling, even in one of these talks here, people talk about graph and they say, well, it, you can take either this model, this model, you get the same results. Well, there is recently a one nice paper we showed that if you take a different model uh, using Stalling graph, I don't, I don't have time to explain, then suddenly typical groups are different than, very different than typical groups in one model. So this is just kind of a warning that model can, the model can influence. But let me show you something that I really hope to create an interest of some of you, and maybe if somebody can, can, uh, can help me, because this is a problem I've been thinking about for a good number of years. Okay, I used the word hyperbolic group before. If you know what is it, fine. If you don't, what is still not so important, because you can understand what I want to say even without this. Gromov asked the following problem, and it's an open problem for at least 20 years. I think since the first paper of Gromov, is every hyperbolic group residually finite? Namely, is it true that for every hyperbolic group, the finite index subgroup intersects the identity? The kind of example of hyperbolic group that we meet on the street are residually finite. The others are, are obtained by this random method. You remember I mentioned that most of the random groups in some sense are hyperbolic. And about them, we don't know. But it's very tempting to try to say, well, let's see if random group is raised to finite or not. The problem is that we don't really know, but let me show you a, a moral proof. This is not a proof. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a proof, but some, something which exists very strongly. And you see that it's a question of, of model. If it would be really not important in which model we are working, then this would be a proof. So here is a proof. I, I, I want to show you that there exists Hyperbolic, uh, pro, hyperbolic groups which are not residually finite. Okay, uh, just warning, this, uh, uh, what I'm going to give now is not a proof. This is still an open problem. But uh, um, then, uh, so, so let's take a, a random group gamma in one of the models, for example, take the model of fix D, fix L. I take a fixed number of generators and a fixed number of relations. And, and uh, uh, in this case, a random group like that will be hyperbolic. And now look at the profinite completion of that group. Okay, by Gromov, gamma is hyperbolic, that is said. G is morally a random profinite group on degenerators and L relations. Why? You see? What you, you pick up, D, you, you fix degenerators and you pick up L random L relations. So this gives you a model for picking up finitely presented discrete group. To each one of them, you associate its profinite completion, which sends you to the space of degenerated L-related 
profinite groups, okay? Okay, of course this map is not on to because on the, on, the, on, the, on the left hand side I had only countably many. On the right hand side it's an uncountable space. But if there is justice in the world, I mean you, you expect that this countably many will distribute evenly in the space of random profinite group, right? We believe that model, all the models will give you the same answer. If this is true, okay, uh, you remember uh, my results with, with, with Yarden based on the classification of finite simple group. There is something to prove here, but um, uh, that, that if I take a random profinite group, then with a positive probability, not probability one, but with some positive probability, it is finite. You remember I told you that the quotient is finite. Which means that many, the profinite completions of many hyperbolic groups like that is a finite group. Which, if you translate it, it means that they have only finitely many subgroups of finite index, and in particular, they are not residually finite. So this is kind of a moral proof, but in, in this world, moral is not counted. <laughs> so this should not be taken as a proof. Now, some of you may, ar may argue you are proving too much. You are proving not only that they're not residually finite, you are proving that they have only finitely many sub of finite index. Well, this is not too much. The people in hyperbolic groups already proved that if there exists non-residually finite hyperbolic group, then there exist hyperbolic groups with only finitely many finite index subgroups. So this is not too much. So this eventually can be made, maybe can be made in a proof if we would know that the two models are the same. And this, you can put a Kajdan Protriti into the game. It's very much related to the work of Amos Nevo on distributing uh, 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 points on, uh, like, how um, this type of results that we know that, that you know uh, uh, something behave nicely for almost every initial point, and here we need it for every or for a specific initial point. Okay, I mean, I'll be happy to talk with some people who will do it. Okay, I have only 10 minutes, and I still, uh, okay, in these 10 minutes, I, uh, I, I wanted to insert something which is more kind of new and maybe related to some of the talks before. Uh, and this is, uh, so, in, in, uh, uh, so this is on the same spirit, but in a, in a kind of a, a new direction. Uh, that we will talk uh, about a group sieve, not groups. Group sieve and random element in infinite discrete group. Uh, I mean, oh, uh, um, this work was very much inspired by the previous, uh, by the, the work that some of them we heard about, about the affine sieve uh, of uh, 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 Burgen, Gambord, and Sarnak, uh, some work done uh, by Igor Rivin, and the, the, the new book of Immanuel Kowalski. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll tell you, I will start with, uh, because anyway, I will not have time to give you the technical, I will start with some application and I'll show you. I have to be careful here, this is still, uh, uh, this talk was coming up kind of too early for me. This, all what I'm talking about is kind of work in progress, things are not written yet. So I, I, uh, this is not like the previous one, which is, which I don't believe I have a proof. Here, I do believe I have a proof, but things should be, uh, should be checked. Anyway, let me start with applications and then I will explain some of it if, uh, according to time. Let gamma be a finitely generated group and let uh, uh, Cn of gamma, depending on this set of generators, the number of conjugacy of, uh, classes of gamma represented in the ball of radius n of gamma. Now usually what we do in, in the business of growth of groups, we count how many elements we have in the ball, and we want to, and we ask how this grows. Here, I count something different. I said, I count the number, the elements in the ball, but only up to conjugacy. How many conjugacy classes? In the, in, in the, in the topological uh, meaning, somehow, uh, instead of counting a, a, a loop with base point, a kind of free loop, there is also some topological uh, interpretation to this. Anyway, Let's look at the log of these numbers, log of Cn of gamma divided by n, and this will be the conjugacy growth of the group. Now, many groups have exponential growth, but this exponential growth can completely kind of collapse when we count modulo conjugacy. In fact, there is a 
there is an interesting group constructed by Dennis Osin that all finitely generated group, that all the elements which uh, accept, uh, uh, of the identity are conjugate to each other. So of course, for this group, this function completely collapse. The question is, uh, 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 this notion was uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 started to be studied by Guba and uh, Mark Sapir, and they ask what happened to linear group, and here is, here is a kind of results, uh, which is a joint work of the four of us. Um, there exists a constant D, depending only on the degree of the linear group. I, I take a finitely generated linear group over the field, uh, uh, over any field, but assume the group is not virtually solvable. You know that for linear groups there is completely different behavior if the group is almost solvable, if not almost solvable. The solvable case is, is, a, is a different story. I will not talk about it now. If you take a non-virtually solvable group, then this limit is bigger than CDO. Of course, I have to say that CD is bigger than one. Otherwise, it's not interesting. I forgot to say. There exists a constant bigger than one, so you have a uniform exponential growth for the conjugacy. Growth? What? No, bigger than one. It's exponent. In order to have exponential growth, this number is bigger than one. And, and what I claim that it's bigger than one, completely independent of the group of the set of generators, depending only on the degree. Uh, it's not that surprising, because let me recall that it was already, uh, there have been a lot of work about the word growth. It already been proved before that the word growth is as exponentially, as a uniform exponential growth, this was a conjecture of Gromov, and that it has exponential, a, a, a uniform exponential growth for all groups, all set of generators, depending only on the degree of representation. Why are you so surprised? What, what? Ah, oh, 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 log, log ga, gamma, no, what do you mean? If I take gamma to the end, if I log, take log, is log. Ah, log to, oh, sorry, sorry, I took, yeah, 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 sorry, 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 zero, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, 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 sorry. <laughs> you know, for group theorists, by once I take it log, it's, things start to be complicated. <laughs> Okay, let me, uh, but uh, uh, frankly, uh, uh, this result is very much related to talks, a previous talk we here, like the work of uh, Bouliard, uh, uh, Bourguin Gambourg, Bouliard, uh, Bouliard, and Emmanuel, and uh, Green and Tau is, is put in, but not the sieve method. Let me put more emphasis on the second problem, which really need a sieve method for it, and this is the kind of, uh, of our goal is to introduce into group theory the sieve method which been so, so much used classically in number theory. So let's take a subject which was pretty classical in group theory. Uh, you take a, let gamma be a finitely generated group and fix a number m, a, a natural number m, which is a, a not one. And look at, the, at, at g to the m, g in gamma, but the set of m powers, not the group generated by the m power, simply the set of those elements which are m powers. Now it goes back to, a, to an old result of Malsev that if gamma is a, an important group, then for every m, gamma to the m contains a finite index subgroup. Okay? In 95, a few of us, Udi Khrushchevsky, Peter Kopler, and Aner Shalev, and I proved a kind of a converse. Well, two types of converse. First of all, I, let me warn you, it's possible there are finitely generated groups which are very much not solvable, not, not nothing, so that every element is an M power. Like in group theory, you can get counter, very strange counterexamples. But we proved that if, if gamma is solvable group and gamma to the m contains a finite index subgroup, then it is a virtually important. Namely, it contains a subgroup of finite a, a, a index which is important. Uh, but we also showed by an example that it's possible that gamma to the m is not a finite, in, is not, it does not contain a finite index subgroup, but it's a finite index 
in the sense that it contains a coset of a finite index subgroup, which means that the set of m power in this solvable group is very large. Some you can, there are finitely many shifts of it will cover the group. On the other hand, for linear groups, uh, we prove that if even it contains a coset of finite index subgroup, then it must be solvable. And so if it contains a finite index subgroup, it must be nil potent together. Which means kind of a converse to Malsev theorem. For, but this, pay attention, we prove it for one M at a time. Here is a more recent theorem. Well, I, I, soon to be a theorem, I hope. This is with Chen Meiri, who is here. Uh, if, if gamma in GLDF is a finitely generated, but not virtually solvable group, okay, that's a, a finitely generated. Now, I, I claim that uh, there exists some beta greater than zero, such that, oh, I forgot, did I say what is P of T? Ah, yeah, P of T is the set of all powers running over all M greater or equal to. All, all powers together. Then we prove that the set of all powers is exponentially small, namely in the, in the, in the ball of radius n, the amount of them which is powers, which are powers of other elements, is, exp is, 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 is very, very small. Um, so this is a very strong improvement of the previous theorem. First of all, it's a quantitative, not just saying that it cannot contain a, 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 a finite index sample, but it's really exponentially small. But what I, I, I'm more excited is that this treats all powers together, not just one, n at a, one m at a time. Before that, and I want to stress, in order to treat all the powers together, you must prove a quantitative results. In the previous results of uh, 10 years, of uh, 95, what we could do, we could, we could prove for one at a time that it is a small subset. But if I take inf a, a countable union of subsets, which each one is small, it can be almost everything. It's only because we can get a quantitative results that we can get. My time is almost over, so let me, uh, add, there are some applications to the mapping class group. Uh, about uh, uh, proving results of the type that almost every element is a pseudo anasov and those which are not pseudo anasov are exponentially small. But let me, uh, uh, I want to say just a few words about, uh, uh, even without, I'll leave it here, but about what, is, what this has to do with sieve method. What is this sieve method? What, what, why this is relevant? Think about a group like SL3Z, and you look at SL3Z modulo a prime p. Well, let's first fix, a, fix an, a number m and ask what happens to the set of m powers in gamma. Gamma is now SL3z. When you, when you put it down mod, mod, mod p, well, then, of course, it goes to m powers in the quotient. Now, using a, a little number theory and some group theory, you prove that there is a positive density set of prime such that the set of m powers in the finite quotient is less than 99%. Most elements in finite groups are maybe m power, but it's less than 99%. And then this is exactly something which, which enable you to go into doing sieving. You say, uh, uh, what is sieving? Sieving, unfortunately, I, I, I hope that by, by the time of my talk, there will be a lot of talking here about sieving. There has not been as much as I, as I expected, so I didn't really prepare it that much here. But uh, sieving is kind of a very sophisticated inclusion and inclusion. And what you prove if, if okay, here is a little bit less, here is a little bit less, here is a little bit less, it's more or less kind of independent of each other, and the independence of each other, and the even distribution is because of property tau, namely because these are expander. What? Of course, of course, SL2P will be easier. Uh, uh, now, what I'm saying here, that uh, 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 
If I want to do it for the full arithmetic group SL3Z, I can use Kashdan property T for it. But due to all these wonderful developments of the last few months by, by Emmanuel, uh, Ben, Green, and Tao, and by uh, Piber and Zabo, we are, and now Ali Reza and uh, Peter Varju are, are, are proving for us exactly the kind of results like the kind of result that you guys are using in F and C. The fact that the group has property Tau with respect Mod, uh, the congruent subgroup, namely when you pull down, you get expander. This tells you that you get an even distribution uh, of the element. So the ball of radius n is kind of evenly distributed mod p. And then you can apply this type of sieve method and to deduce that the set of m power is exponentially small. Well, you have to do in a very uniform way and, and, and then to, the, the, uh, more arguments are needed in order to do uh, uh, all the M's together, but somehow I, I think I will, this is, uh, I, I will just, I have to finish, or I will stop here. Uh, you, I mean, the proof is much more complicated, but basically it's very much inspired by all these F and C method that were developed uh, around here. In the, last, uh, in the last few years, in this Apollonian package. I mean, it's, it's sort of the same type of thinking applied in a group theoretical uh, considerations. And we kind of hope this is sort of a first application in this direction, what we hope that uh, the future will bring uh, many more. In fact, uh, we have a feeling that we have a very good technique and not enough problems to us. <laughs> So maybe if you, have, if you can ask some problem that is suitable to attack it by this technique, we will be very happy. Thank you very much.